with former Vancouver Canuck and TSN hockey analyst Frank Corrado. And regular listeners will know that Frank's been joining us here for the last month or month and a half. And we're exceedingly pleased to announce today that Frank is going to be a part of our program weekly going forward Woo! on Thursdays. So thank you, Mr. Corrado, for jumping aboard this sinking ship. Appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you guys for having me. I enjoy this. Uh, Frank, we so enjoy talking to you. Um, And Blake has mentioned it before, like he could be the next Ferraro. This seems so easy for you, effortless. You're a natural in broadcasting. Where does that come from? Um, I don't know. I I think I want to credit Big Sal, actually, because here here was my routine as a kid, okay? Um, get a junior golf membership for like 500 bucks. And when the other kids would go to like summer camp or anything like that, it was like, I'm going to drop you off on my way to work, figure it out for the day. And then I'll pick you up on my way home from work. So play 18 holes, go to the driving range, make some friends, talk to people, figure it out. And I'll see you when I get home. Here's 20 bucks for lunch. So, and then, and then I ended up getting a job at the golf course when I was, uh, 14, which I think you could only, I don't, I don't know if you could start that early, but I don't know. Somehow I got in at 14 and I was mm-hmm. like cleaning members clubs and greeting them upon arrival. Then I realized the more friendly and talkative I was, the more likely I was to like get tips. <laughs> right. So I, I'm telling you, I was walking around Holy Cross Catholic Academy in grade nine, just strapped <laughs> with cash because of all the tips <laughs> I was getting. <laughs> uh... Yeah. Sodas and candy on Frank at lunchtime. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank Big Sal for us. That's Frank's dad, if you're unfamiliar. <laughs> He's the one who has been very generous with Blake and I over the years, sending us his the best sauce. So I mm. appreciate that, Frank. Uh, we have big uh, Vancouver Canucks news yesterday. Philip Ronick, the defenseman from Detroit, comes over for a first and second round pick. Let's talk about the player, Frank, and then talk about the trade itself. What do you make of the player? Good player. Yeah, really good player. Excellent puck mover. Good poise with the puck. He's got a little, like, he's got some intensity and fire to his game, which I really like. Um, the thing that kind of stands out is, you know, there's he's one of those guys, he can carry the puck, he can move the puck. Like, he's, he's definitely a transporter, a distributor. He's good on the power play. Part of the reason why maybe Detroit wants to move on from him is the fact that Moritz Sider has really been that number one guy on the right-hand side, and that was Hronik's position before Sider got there. He was that guy. I don't know for sure, but I sense there was maybe a little bit of like, okay, that's my old ice time, and I don't necessarily love that this guy's getting it all. How can you argue it, though? Moritz Sider is an unbelievable defenseman. Um, Not to mention, he's get, still getting 21 and a half per game this year. Totally, game. totally. I mean, he's getting his ice, but okay. Yeah, um, yeah. but yeah, outside of that, I, I think he's he's a really good player. I would love to see him play with Quinn Hughes. I don't know. I, I kind of made this point yesterday. Quinn Hughes has played with Chris Tanev. He's played with Luke Shen. He's played with Tyler Myers. All those, like, this would probably be the best puck mover that he would play with if they were to be D partners. So that kind of excites me from a Vancouver point of view. Do you spread your, do you spread the wealth there though? Or do you just load up? Well, so that's the thing. Yeah. You don't have enough wealth to spread, unfortunately. No. Right. No. So I, I like I'm, I get excited about seeing good players play with good players. I, like, I, I want to see guys who, are on the same kind of wavelength, play with each other. And listen, they're in the position where they don't need to, they're not trying to win anything. They're not going for anything. It's a retool, right? So why not see what these guys can do together? I'm pretty yep. excited. Like, I'm pretty excited to see that kind of happen for Quinn Hughes and for the Serona kid. He's a good player. He's 25 years old. You would have to think as a defenseman, like he's kind of just stepping into his prime years now. Like you have those years where you're figuring out the league and then you're figuring out how to like, be productive and get by defensively. Like now should be the time where it's like, this guy should get cooking here in the next three, four years. The other consideration uh, with regards to who plays with whom on the Canucks, Ethan Bear is the really only RFA the Canucks have to consider. And, you know, how much term, how much money on Bear does he fit with Hughes? So that's something else that they'll figure out with another right shot defenseman uh, between now and the end of the season. What did you make of the price the Canucks paid for? Ronick. It's interesting, and I, I see a lot of chatter about the price being high. The first thing that came to mind was when you're a player and you're a restricted free agent, and you see other players around the league signing, other restricted free agents signing, and you're looking at it and you're thinking, 
wait a second, why is my negotiation so low compared to that guy? And an agent will tell you, well, you're not negotiating with that team. That's an internal negotiation. You're only having these negotiations. So it's a weird trade because Vancouver, who you would think is a rebuilding team, gives up a, a first round pick to get a player who's going to help them. Now you think of that as a rental. My take on that is they want to get players in now and work with guys like talk it, Henrik and Daniel, rather than trust their scouting staff to a draft, a good player. Let's just use the CHL example. Wait two years now before you get that player into your organization now wait another three years for that player to come off entry level and really see what the player is all about. Like, so it, it, it does feel like a fast tracking, I guess. And that kind of makes sense when you, you know what they've said, right? Like it's a retool. It's not a rebuild. That kind of fits even with the other players that they've gotten in Beauvillier and Ratu and um, Kraftsoff. Like, I don't even know if I said that right, but you know, so there is, you can see that the emphasis on, on turning things around pretty quickly. I'll tell you what, I, I don't have a, a huge issue with the price. And this is where, Matthew, tell me I'm wrong. Oh, Tell me I'm wrong. If you don't draft and develop <laughs> good defensemen, it's going to cost you a lot to go out and acquire them. Especially right shot guys. Have you Frankie. been listening to this show, Frank? Especially right side guys, Frank. You don't give up on twenty-two-year-old right shot defensemen. Sure. We've had this discussion. We've, on we, the we've show had before. this discussion, but that, like, if you don't have anyone internally, mm -hmm. you want to go get a guy who can move the puck, yeah. play on a first pairing, give you good power play minutes. It's going to cost you, and that's the cost yep. of doing business. Ask Julian Breezebob what he thinks of penal um, draft yeah. picks. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, very fair. And, and, and look, uh, we talked about it yesterday. This is an all-situations player at the biggest organizational weakness. So from that standpoint, you love the acquisition. Now, whatever he does this year doesn't really matter at the end of the day. In fact, he may even exceed. Uh, he may even enhance uh, their record, which, of yeah. course, decreases their Connor Bedard. Uh, now, next year at 4-4, four, four, that's a really good market value. Like, that's really below market. That is a really good contract for them next year. You just wonder what he's going to cost the year after and going That's forward. Right. Yeah. It'll probably be market value. And then at that point, you're still looking for those young, cheap players to come in. And I've been having this conversation with guys on Twitter all day long here is that's it, like in a vacuum. <laughs> and remember, it's the first and a second kind of yes. for, for her. Yeah. Um, you, uh, yeah, you get better more immediately. You have the guarantee that he's an NHL player. But of course, when you've got multiple draft picks in the top forty, as the Canucks had, you know, chances are one or two of those are going to pan out. You hope you hope that they Set, do. And then you and then you've got them on ELC money for three years, yeah. and then another club control for four after that, um, where you can massage those numbers. Maybe you sign them to an extension um, after a two-year bridge deal, and you've got them on a reasonable contract for 10 years Here's, as opposed to stepping in and needing to extend this guy in 12 months. And I'll tell you what, this guy, like, he's going to want his market value just from the way things kind of yeah. went in Detroit. Like, I, I just feel like he's going to be one of those guys where it's like, no, 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 the dollars and cents better make sense. But one of the – one of the, we talk about this um, in Toronto sometimes, and sometimes we do, like, betting segments. I don't really do it that much, but I'll hear it. And it's like if the Vancouver Canucks are featured, someone's getting a five spot. Either the Canucks are getting a five spot or the other <laughs> team's getting a five spot or both teams are getting a five spot. So a lot of times it has to do with the over-under. You know there's a five involved. So when you, when you think about the Canucks, they can score, right? If Demko's healthy, got a really good goaltender, the back end and the commitment to playing a team defense has been obviously the issue, which you guys know. So I guess you could say, I don't know if it's a flyer, but you could say theoretically, if you were to add some pieces on the back end that could help you, you're, you're in decent shape up front. You really are. Like Kuzmenko has been an excellent addition. He scored a ton. Like Elias Pettersson is back to being what we all thought he is, a superstar in the league. So I'm, I'm more on the optimistic side of this deal. I really am. I, and this wouldn't be the last deal for them. Like, they, they need to do more on the back end, but it's a good start as far as getting defensemen who can help move the puck. And that's it, Frank. They're probably another couple of defensemen away, and they're probably a couple of centers away if you think JT Miller belongs on the wing. 
uh, or at the very least, they're a, a good third line center away down the down center ice. You'd be the right guy to ask this. So they give up what would be pick 14 and pick 38 if the draft was being held today, Frank. You cover a lot of junior hockey for TSN. Boy, you can get a couple of pretty good players. It's a good draft. With those picks. It's a it's a really good draft. Like I know just talking to Craig Button, he's one of the guys that um, you know, we're in constant communication with about the draft and um man it just seems like this draft there's going to be some players deeper into the first round like mid to late first round that can that can make an impact um and it's weird to say that because these are the guys that have been probably you know affected by the covid lockdowns and and that kind of thing but um this like this is the 05 age group there i mean there's there's a ton of guys but with that being said it kind of goes back to unless you're picking in the top five, maybe top 10, is there anyone coming to help you next year? Like you're still, you're still a little ways away. And I'm not saying that's right because I, I would like to build from the ground up, right? Like do it with a little more sustainability, but you guys know as well as everyone listening, that's not the mandate in Vancouver. The mandate is turn it around as soon as humanly possible. So that's why these moves reflect that way. And it's like, yep. you know, here's another example for you. The Minnesota Wild, they just keep acquiring draft picks. They just broker deals so they can acquire picks because they probably believe that their scouting staff, led by Judd Brackett and company, is going to draft excellent players and they will de- develop them and they will help their team. Is made. Or, or if you acquire enough, Frank, then you can peel off a couple it's a, to get a Ronin. Sure. When you've got a lot of them, sure. when they're all, when you've only got this much, maybe keep them. part. That, that, that's, yeah, and I, I don't disagree. But part of it yeah. is the players that are always already there, whether it's Hughes, whether it's Pedersen, Kuzmenko, Miller, Demko. The players you're going to draft now may not be ready by the time. Like those guys are kind of ready now. Right. So yep. like the, there's there's too many differing timelines. So you almost have to pick the best of a, a not so great situation, if that makes sense. Although you never know when that time is like did Andre mm-hmm. Kopitar ever think, you know, Brant Clark was going to be playing with him and contributing on a, on a playoff. Right. Like you just you never know. For sure. Right? You just. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is why you always have that trickle. You always have that IV drip well, of prospects and, and, coming and in. And to your point, Blake, like. You're seeing teams now that are saying, I don't care about draft picks. I'm going to make my team as strong as I can right now because I'm going into the playoffs. And you know what I trust a lot of those teams have? Contingency plans, where if they need to liquidate, similar to what Chicago's doing right now, where they're, they're, they're liquidating and they're just accumulating picks and picks and picks and draft picks or prospects. And they're like, okay, this is it. This was our emergency valve. Now we're starting all over again. One day Mm -hmm. that's going to happen to the Tampa Bay lightning. I don't know when, Mm -hmm. but the Tampa Bay lightning will be that team that at some point is going to have to get rid of Stamkos, Kucherov, you name it. And it's like, here come all the picks and we're starting all over again. And you hope you hit on a few top five, top 10 picks. And then they're good for another 10 years again. When do the Bruins do that? (laughs) <laughs> they don't seem to have to need to do No, that. because they just signed Pasternak today. Yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> right? Like, so, um, yeah. Do you want to announce the, the Pasternak signing, the terms of it? <laughs> uh, it's funny because a few years ago, the trend was first-round picks are untouchable. The most we'll trade is second-round picks. We'd prefer to trade third-round picks. Guys, 12 first-round picks have been traded yeah. at this deadline. And we were talking, Frank, just a little bit before we started recording here because uh, I know you're going to be on, on Trade Center tomorrow for a first time. What an incredible deadline. Like, this is fascinating stuff yeah. from a number of GMs with some big, Even big if there's swings. not any new trades, or there will be some yeah. tomorrow, but even if there's not a lot, just a recap, a totality recap right. of what's happened to date is going to be good enough. It's, you know yep. what? I feel like I got my fill yesterday. So it was 6 Eastern, 3 Pacific, and myself and Craig Button were doing Sports Center with Rod Smith, and we had planned this, like, 30, 40 minutes of content where it was just going to be trade related on things that had happened in the past. And not even five minutes into our show, the Jake Chikorin trade happened. So Rod Smith is on the screen talking to Pierre Lebrun, who's on remote. Lebrun's talking. Rod goes, "Um, Pierre, I actually have to cut you off. Jacob Chikorin just got traded. And LeBron, like, because he was on with us, he couldn't break the trade, right? So he's oh, he's on with us, and then it was like, boom, cameras on me and Craig, and and we just had to talk about it. But that 
I feel like we really got the authentic Trade Center experience right there. And like, I'm going to be on the back desk with Brian Hayes. So we'll be doing some, some other stuff, but it was like the chirping, the chirping desk. I don't know. Yeah. Like the hot take, you know, hot take kind <laughs> yes. of desk, I guess we'll yeah. be back there. But it felt like we were the, the main crew yesterday, Craig, Craig, myself and Rod. And so everyone did a good job. It was fun. Uh, but you know what? Like we have tons to talk about and now we can kind of even talk about who fits better, where, like, I don't know. There's there's all kinds to talk about with these trades. I love it. I think it's so good for the game. And I give these general managers a lot of credit because the salary cap is the way it is. And it's been so stagnant for so long. They have gotten really creative and made a lot of interesting moves. I think it's so good. Let, let me ask you this. Uh, you brought up the Pasternak deal. $11.25 million. It feels like it's been a long time since we saw a double-digit cap hit signed. Is Elias Pettersson going to be the next one? Oh, oh yeah. Are you kidding me? Elias Pettersson, that guy's unbelievable. I, I love watching him play. I think he's so intelligent. And listen, ultimately, we can talk about how good a player is all we want. We can talk about the highlight reel and how, how much he does for the city, this and that. It all comes down to comparables. If your numbers are the same as player X and player Y, then your money equals that. That's, that's the bottom line. So... Um, does he have that ability? Absolutely. You know, he's he's a health, heck of a player. And when you think about where the salary cap is going to be in a few years, where they're talking about ninety six million, million, and um, you know the star player gets a certain percentage of the cap, how is Elias Pettersson not getting that percentage of the cap? Uh, Vitaly Kraftsoff, our first chance to talk to you about him. You were in the KHL with him. At what point? What do you know about this player, which seems like a worthwhile gamble for the Canucks? Yeah, so quick little story there. I think he would have been playing on Chelyabinsk Tractor. I don't know. Maybe maybe just double-check that. I'm pretty sure he did play on Chelyabinsk Tractor. So we had a game against them early in the season, and they were a really good team. And for some reason, our team came out really flat. We were garbage. And it was a 4-1 game, and I'm breaking the puck up on the power play. And it was like our third time trying to gain entry. We're about a minute 10 into this power play. And all my forwards, they failed me. They really did. They failed me. They were all waiting (laughs) up by the blue line. I turned the puck over. I don't know who went in and scored. But I got back to the bench, and that was halfway through the second. And I sat there the entire rest of the game. I didn't go out for a single other shift. And so I got to watch this kid play. That was kind of interesting. (laughs) Um Skilled player, good wheels, very creative, little bit of flash and dash. Like he scored some pretty highlight reel goals between the legs. Um, I, I, I think there's, there's a, a unique skill set there. I know there's always going to be like that threat of going back to the KHL if things don't work out for him. So that's something they'll have to monitor because he did that when he was with New York and he went back. And, um, but a worthy gamble for sure. Like it, it, it's hard. It's, we always talk about players with the grit and determination. Well, you're kind of seeing you, those players, you can go and acquire them. Like they're, that's, that's kind of the trades that have been happening right now. But the, the players with the high-end skill and that kind of creativity, if you can take a flyer on a guy like that, it, it's a worthwhile gamble. Who let you down? Hunter yeah. Shaker? We see the one hanging Hunter, out by the Hunter, yeah. Hunter yeah. let me down. Um, Emil Poirier. Yeah, yeah. 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 Seriously, yeah. Brandon. Yeah. They let you down. Brandon yeah. Gormley <laughs> let me down. Um, <laughs> uh, Reese Scarlett wasn't on the ice. He didn't let me down there. Okay. We'll let, we'll let him off the yeah. hook. <laughs> Boy. It, 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 it was an all Canucks draft pick power play <laughs> there yeah. in the cage. So. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, tomorrow, your uh, big uh, debut on Trade Center. And uh, and uh, did I see this right? Did you manage to avoid boy bands duty? Yeah, so fun- <laughs> funny <laughs> enough, I did avoid it, but not intentionally. I was, uh, where, I, was at, I was at TSN the other day. Well, I'm there every day, but I was there. I was in the green room the other day getting makeup done, and Duffy walked in. And he looks over, and he saw me, and he goes, Oh, he goes, I should have called you. I could have used you the other day for this music video. I said, it's all good, buddy. I'll catch me on the next one. Yeah, <laughs> next year, watch out. Yeah. I think you may have a starring role yeah. alongside Mr. O'Neill. Frankie, thank you for this, buddy. Look forward to these Thursday conversations, my man. Yeah, likewise. Appreciate, thank you. appreciate this, and we'll catch up next week. See ya.